if you got a request, just I make a request. Why is it pretty good? Man. Yeah, dude. So I, I take requests. I got funny. I got scary. <laughs> I got historical mythology. I can make something up on the spot. You make the request, I give. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, I'm what do you? How about how about whatever you're feeling? Whatever I'm feeling. I want. I want. I want. Yeah, I want your heart to be in it, so you know. I want my heart to be in it, all right. Well, I okay, am a big fan of mythology and good old legends, so how about okay. I make up a legend? Okay, I'm into it. All right. So, again, this is all improv. This is just me pulling it out of nowhere. So, I'm going to tell you the story of the tomb of Nazir. Now, the great tomb of Nazir is a place long lost in history. No one knows quite where it is anymore, but in the dawn of man, when we were first dotting castles around the lands, and raiders took to the land to take what they could and what little they could get, there was a story about a once great empire, the Empire of Nazir, and there was a tomb left behind that was said to contain all manner of riches, anything you could want, magic, weapons, wealth, food, anything, to anyone could find it, could live as a king or queen Why? in their own right. Why? Now, Why? Why? Anyway, Shh. so, at one point, a group of adventurers, raiders really, that liked to think they were blessed by the gods, decided that they would find the tomb of Nazir. They would find it, they would take its riches, and they would carve out an empire for themselves. One to rival that of the Ottomans, the Romans, and everything else that was to be and to come. They decided that they would find this tomb. And so they set out looking for it, day and night across thousands of miles, different lands and different languages, people they never thought they would see in their life. They did what they could to track down this great tomb until they came upon a place, an ancient forest that had burned down many years ago and left nothing but ash. Usually things would regrow, but this did not. It was not but dust, ash, and the bones of those that had come before them. But they said, we are stronger than those that came before us. We will get this great tomb. Even those that have died before us, we can do better. Because we are better armed, we are better equipped, and we are better trained. We have no fear, for the gods are on our side. And so, they went deeper into the Ashlands, looking for this great tomb. Now... They ran into many hurdles. The bones of the dead would whisper, trying to take them off their path. Demons in the shadows that plagued their mind and gave nightmares nightly. There were all manner of creatures, fey, even angels, they say, that would try to get them off the course, but they said no. They wanted the treasure in the tomb. At one point, they found an old hermit. He wobbled on his cane and he moved forward and with a finger that a bone, he pointed at them and said, you will not find the tomb unless you can pass in traces that no living man can ever pass. And so he hobbled forward on the cane and he said to them, you will die if you are not careful. The group, they laughed. This old man living among bones had clearly lost his mind. There was no way he knew what was around here. And so, with an axe in hand, the leader struck down the man, killing him on the spot because how dare he try to break their morale. Demons had tried, angels, spirits, even the ancestors, but they would not stop. So why would this man made of flesh be the one to stop them? They cut him down and continued deeper into the Ashlands. Till finally, after days had passed and their food was running low, they see on the horizon a great rune of some kind. All these houses and all these buildings broken apart by time, the killer of everything. Time itself had whittled down the doors, broken down the walls, and the columns themselves were covered in moss and growth. They said this must be where the great tomb is. And with that, at the very center, they saw it. A grand temple that rose high into, sky, into the sky as if it was a very seat of the gods themselves. And they told themselves, this is it. This must be the great tomb of Nazir. So they moved forward. With the axes in hand and bravery at their side, they would not be stopped. They opened all obstacles before them. And the traps did not work. Traps ancient in make no longer worked as they should, for time had withered them away. So they moved forward into the tomb and found nothing. 
they thought to themselves, why is there nothing here? We have come such a great way. What treasures were we meant to get? And then one of them stepped back, and then a click. And in front of them, a door opened on the floor, as if revealing to them what was to be. They stepped forward and saw stairs leading straight down as if to hell itself. And so, with bravery still at their side, they walked deep down into the tomb until the dark was nothing but their ally. Torches would not cast a light farther than their fingers, so they did not know what was there, but they were not scared. They continued forward until finally they reached the ground floor and the tomb lit up like the night sky with a beautiful full moon. Torches all around them lit to show the bones of those that had come before, but they would still not falter until they saw at the very end of the hall, amid a mountain of glittering gold, shining silver, and bronze brighter than you can imagine, weapons the like of which they'd never seen, and mountains of preserved food, things that would make them a king. They saw an old man, hunched over on a cane, sitting on the throne that was ruined beyond time. And they looked at him, and he appeared as though that man they had killed not many, not few days before. The old man said, Men come here to die in search of greed. He lifted up on his cane and walked forward, shaking as he did so, and he pointed at them once more and said, Your greed will be the end of you unless you can answer my riddles. Now, they decided, why should we answer a riddle? We have cut this man down before, let us cut him down again. What can he do to stop us from taking everything? So they go forward and they cut down the man once more. And when they did so, he did not fight back. He did not flinch. He merely said, I weep for you. They did not understand why he would do such thing, but the moment they touched the gold, the first to touch the gold turned to stone. And they thought, well, clearly he's a fool. He should not go for the gold. So another went for the silver, and he too was turned into silver. They thought maybe we should take not treasure, but the food itself. So one of them, upon opening the barrel, saw glittering golden biscuits, meat that had been preserved long before and was still tasty to even look at, and he began to eat. He ate and ate and ate until his belly exploded and he collapsed. He could not stop himself. The last two told themselves, perhaps we should take nothing from this. Instead, let us see what this old man's corpse has. So one of them flipped over the old man's corpse, and there was nothing. It was but dust in the robes. Another one looked and saw a great sword, gleaming as if kissed by the gods, as if Hephaestus himself had forged it with love. He grabs the sword, knowing that he will become a powerful warrior unmatched by any. And as he does so, his skin leaves his body, his muscles deteriorate, and his bones turn into rock as he himself stands holding the sword and becomes the guardian of the treasure, frozen in time to watch what he cannot have. The last one, the last one, who prided himself on being the smartest, said that he would not take anything except the cane that the old man had, for clearly it must be worth something. And as he picked it up, he felt time grip around his neck, holding him tightly as his youth disappeared until he could not even walk. He slunk down and sat in the throne, for he was so very tired. And then he saw, he saw an empire of gold, an empire of silver unmatched. And he knew that now he would be stuck in this tomb to watch what he could not have. And that's the story of the tomb of Nazir. That's great, dude. I have a, I have a question for you, actually. Yeah, what's up? Nice. Thank you, thank you. What's up? Have you ever, have you, have you ever considered being a DM, or are you a DM? Because it sounds he like you're a DM. A DM. <laughs> Fun fact: yeah, I, I have, I'm say. 24 years old, right? I picked up D and D when I was uh -huh. 11, and I have played four right. times. I have DM'd everything else for years because just nobody wants to DM, and I'm like, <laughs> I like telling stories. Fuck it, I'll DM. I do funny. I do scary. How come you don't, how come you don't get up on stage? You want me on the Good. stage? Yeah, you should go up on the stage. <laughs> the stage okay, over right, there. The stage. Does anybody have a request? Scary. You want a scary story? All right. Sure. 
Interesting. All right. Yes, a so, spooky story. You want a spooky story? All right. Let me tell you a good story then that's going to spook you, all right? So, let me tell you the story of the old... <coughs> Excuse me, I need to take a drink of water. Let me tell you the story of the old mansion stuck deep in Louisiana, which once was run by a man known as the Demon of the Swamps. A very terrible man. Now, long ago, when America was first being made, you know, when we were first expanding forward, taking with manifest destiny, and finding what was on this great land we call our own, we found an area deep in the swamps. Now, at first, people were confused. There was a mansion here, a great estate, but it was abandoned. There was nobody here. We had only just arrived in the swamps, but this looks like it had been here for years, generations even. There was a great estate, painted white and coated in vines. The swamp itself had begun to suck away at the foundation. Buildings all over that were covered in moss, lichen, even growths on the inside began to take it as Mother Nature reclaimed her own. But if it had been here for so long, people wondered, why was it not taken yet? What was still here? Now, for many years, they ignored it. There had been owners time and time again, but nobody had been able to keep the house for long, complaining of strange noises, demons in the night, or maybe even creatures from the bayou being too aggressive. Now, for some reason, though, people would sometimes die in this building. They would disappear with only one survivor ever found, and soon after, they would take their own life. The house went down. Nobody bothered to touch it for many years until we reached the early 2000s. Now this place, this estate, was a beautiful vacation area. Sure, it was a little out of the way and stuck in the swamps, but with modern day development, it was a rather interesting place. A little bit of historical mysticism for which you could spend a summer evening. Just something that you could enjoy. And then we had a few individuals go there. We had six people arrive college kids that wanted a nice summer getaway. You know, they just wanted to enjoy some peace and quiet. And as they came here, people didn't want to stay at first. It was old, it was ratty, yeah, but door. it was Let's cheap. Go. So they stayed. They stayed and enjoyed a nice time. At the first, it was normal. Occasionally out in the distance you would hear wild animals and the screams and the cries, the whooping of things trying to bump in the night and make themselves superior. But one night, one of these individuals uh, got hungry. They got up, vehicle. because as you do, you want a nice little midnight snack. And they went down into the kitchen. As they go down into the kitchen, the noises become greater. The Thank rattling you. of trees against the window, the howls in the distance, wailing even, the sounds of nature. Now, this person didn't much care. They were from the city. What did they have to worry about? So they get themselves a snack. And as they walk back to their room, out of the corner of the eye, they see another individual walk past them, down the hall. They look, and they call out to see if it's a friend of theirs. No answer. They go back to their room. And so they think, well, they went to their room. I guess it is what it is. Maybe they didn't hear me. So they fall asleep. The next morning, they wake up, and their friend from that room does not join them for breakfast. They think, eh, probably sleeping in. So... The next night rolls around after they're done with their daily activities, going around exploring nature, taking a nature hike, or maybe running into town to get some snacks. And the next day rolls around, and that same man from before gets hungry again at night, this time much more ravenously than before. As if the food he had just had not mere hours ago had vanished and his stomach had become a great void. He was so very hungry. He went into the kitchen, and as he did so, he heard the clattering clattering of chains and this terrified him what was going on he looked around and nothing was there and then outside he heard a wail he opened the door and screamed for whoever that was shut up I'm trying to sleep it went quiet as it went quiet he tried to look around his eyes adjusting to the dark and he saw someone standing by the shed and he yelled who is that no response. Daisy, is that you? What are you doing outside? No response. So he goes forward. He tries to investigate who it is. And in the back, 
we hear a whisper. Help me. He looks around. Nothing's there. What's going on? He looks to the shed once again and moves forward. And as he puts his hand out, he grabs the shoulder of someone, turns it around, only to see a rotting corpse. It does not move. It does not make a noise. But it is there, chained around the collar, hands bound and legs standing. It is floating there in the air as if a ghost. He screams, runs away, waking up the rest of the house. They join him outside, lights turn on, flashlights going out, but there's nothing out there. Nothing. And then they notice. One of their group is missing. One of their group is missing. They go through the house, screaming for her name. Daisy! Daisy! Where are you? Her door is locked. So they bust it down open, and inside, the bed is perfectly made. It is perfectly made, not a speck of dust anywhere, but Daisy is nowhere to be found. They look around for her again because they cannot lose their friend. Where did she go? Did she have something to do with outside? Who knows? They look around until one of them stumbles upon the basement. And in the basement, they find blood. Fresh blood, but also old blood. They think to themselves, something happened, we need to find Daisy. So they run around again, calling her name, but they find nothing. They say they will try again in morning, because at night, no one can see anything. They are in the swamp. What are they going to do? Get lost? Thank you for the microphone. They're worried they might get lost. So morning rolls around, not two hours later. The sun starting to break through the tree line, and they run again, trying to find her. They call out in the swamp, Daisy! Daisy, where are you? Then one of them trips. They trip. And they find a corpse, a corpse of their friend. Chains wrapped all around her and bundled in cloth, dirty and covered in blood. But the blood is not hers. It's old, black and brown, rotting even. They go back to the house and they try to get a hold of the sheriff, police, if you will. But there is no one to call them. No one picks up the phone. No one answers. So they try again. Someone is out here and they are messing with us. We need to take care of them. They grab weapons, they try to figure out what's happening, but nothing. There is no one out there. They return once again to the house, and they say they will leave. They pack up the car, they drive, and then they notice a very thick fog surrounds the road, surrounds the entire house, and as they drive through the fog, it begins to shake, the car beginning to rustle. And as they come out of the fog, in front of them, they see the mansion again. They begin to panic. Something is wrong. This is not natural. We went straight, absolutely. So they once again go to the house, try to get their bearings, maybe see if their phones can get a connection, but nothing. GPS will not work. Maps are are no longer around. And the outside, the fog moves in slowly. The next night rolls around, and they all hoard together in one room. And outside, they hear the rattling of chains, the shaking of chains, the wailing, moans of pain. And then they hear Daisy's voice. Help. Help. And then a scream. Ah! Right? One of them decides they must know what's going on. So they open the door. They go forward. They look around and it's nothing. It's pitch black. Until at the end of the hall, they see a shadowy figure. They run at them with what they have. A broomstick. Nothing good. They did not bring any weapons with them. And they strike the figure. It goes down. He hits it again and again and again until it doesn't move. They think they've caught the killer. The one who took Daisy from them. And then they notice. As he left the room, one of their group was missing. Now there were only four. And as they look at what they had beaten to death, they find their friend. Ben, his brains bashed in, and he was no longer with us. They panic, thinking he was just with us. Where did he go? They hold up once again. When morning comes, they try to leave. They cannot. The fog has grown even closer until it is just outside the estate. Now they are worried. They think this might be the end of them. They begin to try to get through the day, drinking, eating, doing whatever they can. The man from earlier, from the beginning of our story, grows hungry. As if he has not eaten in days, weeks even, he feels starved. And as he does, when the night comes, 
he gets hungry. He tries to go to the kitchen to eat, but he does not want to leave and get hurt. So one of his friends come with him, and as he goes to the kitchen, the food is rotten. Maggots infest everything. Mold has grown deep, and the kitchen itself is covered in black mold, as if it had been abandoned for years. He is too hungry to care. And so he eats, and he eats, and his friend tries to stop him. And then, he bites into his friend's neck, hungry. He eats more and more, biting away, until he realizes what he has done, and he cries. His friends join him, and he looks up at them, and he is still hungry. He reaches out, tries to eat more, and he gets one of them, and the other begins to fight back, but then he kills them as well, and begins to eat. He begins to eat more and more, and as his friends lay around him in pieces, he stands up, starving, as if he has not had a meal in years. And in front of him, he sees a man in a fine white suit. Surrounding him, other individuals, Native Americans, Blacks, Whites, everyone, in chains from all across the ages. The man in the white suit grins, his teeth white as pearls, and his gums bleeding red. His eyes are black as coal, and he says, Welcome, welcome to the family. The man hungers. He reaches out to try to eat, but collapses, for his stomach is too full, too great, and he dies on the spot. The house by the next morning is clean, and once again, another group descends upon it to enjoy a lovely, vacation. And that's the story of the house in the marsh. Thank you. What the hell? That was so That was amazing. That was all improv. Keep in mind, I made this all up on screen. Can I have the shimmels now? Was that like a Wendigo thing? I'm scared. I kind of regret. I kept looking around my head. That's not a story to tell the kids. Hey there, and thanks for watching. I really appreciate it if you could like the video and maybe even subscribe if you enjoyed yourself. This whole thing is kind of part of a new project I want to do with the channel where I go throughout VR chat, telling stories and maybe even collecting a few. The world is a bit of a hectic place right now, so I'm hoping maybe by sharing stories and everything, we can all laugh and maybe get a sense of wonder through everything. Stories have kept people entertained for generations, and I just want to share a couple of them and maybe even create a few new ones. If you've enjoyed the video, I'm really glad, and if you have any feedback, feel free to leave it in the comments. I'm always looking to improve because I know I'm not perfect at this. For those of you that want to join and see these stories live, I am going to be getting on VR chat every Friday from 2 p.m. CST to 5 p.m. CST. In order to tell stories, collect them, might go a little longer, maybe a little less, it depends entirely what happens. But in the future, I might also try to stream this. We'll see what happens because I really want to try to work with a larger audience and really just kind of make everybody laugh and have a good time. So thanks again for watching this vid. I hope you had a wonderful time. Bye bye